So we're in Romans 10 tonight. We're going to see if we can deal with all 21 verses. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, are going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Verse 5. For Moses, for Moses describes the righteousness, the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth these things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ again, up Christ again from the dead. But what saith the word that is nigh, even in thy mouth and thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich upon all that call upon him. Verse 13. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except that they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah say, Lord, who have believed our report? 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed, their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First, Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will anger you by a foolish nation. Verse 20. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not, I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long, I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. All right. So this makes sense to us now, right? <laughs> Bad. Being ignorant, I understand that part. Verse three. <laughs> <laughs> what is gain saying um no, doing something to benefit or to promote yourself okay so he's continuing his he's continuing his discussion in chapter nine um that he started in chapter nine and of course he, just like in chapter nine he begins um that his heart is hurting for the people of israel um his prayer is that they would be saved because they have a, they have a zeal to God, but it's not based on knowledge. And of course, Paul Paul knows that very well. Paul had a zeal for God that was not based on knowledge, so he understands um, the blind the blindness of being in that that state of being, right? And so when God knocks him off his horse and he becomes blind, and then he you know so he begins to realize the same process that God brought him through or brought him out of, is what he's praying that God will bring the rest of Israel out of. But he's also, um, he's also recalling this to us because he doesn't want us, he doesn't want the Gentiles to become proud of the gospel, that they have the gospel and then end up in the same blindness. So it's, a, it's, a, it's always, of course, the truth is always a double-edged sword, right? It, works, it cuts both ways. So verse 3, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Now, you'll notice, again, he, he goes, the same thing he did in Romans chapter 3, he talks about the righteousness of God. 
So it's not the righteousness of Christ. So, so this is this is critical because this is why he says that Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone that believes. Because Jesus did not trust in his own righteousness. He trusted by faith in his father's righteousness. So he becomes the end or the goal or the maturing or the fulfilling, the revelation of, of completeness of what we are to become in him. So we are to trust in the righteousness of God, the same as Christ trusted in the righteousness of God, right? So this is important because, because if Jesus established his own righteousness and lived according to his own righteousness, well, that's what the Jews are trying to do. That's what all of us try to do. So Jesus came to be not only the righteousness of God, but he came to be a demonstration of what, of what we are supposed to be in Christ. Does that make sense? Now, it seems like a subtle difference, but it's not. This is why want, there's, a, there's this big debate over whether Jesus is divine or not. Because throughout the scriptures, Jesus, even though he is God, takes a lower, uh, he lowers himself. And then he depends on the, on the righteousness of his father, not on his own righteousness. So then people read what Jesus did and they begin to think that he's not divine. Well, that's not true. They're misunderstanding what, what it's saying. So anyway. So he says, Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law, that a man which do these things shall live by them. And of course, that's a result of Sinai, right? But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise, saying, Say not in thy heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. Um, there's a bunch of stuff there. Deuteronomy chapter 30, Paul, uh, Rome, uh, Moses talked about um, that the word of God was near them. Remember, remember, Moses went up the mountain. Moses kept coming down the mountain. And of course, while he's up on the mountain, what are they doing? Making the calf. They're worshiping the golden calf. So the, the point is, again, they're, they're going about to establish their own righteousness is what they're doing. And so... So Moses reminds them about going up and down the mountain. There's also uh, other places in the Bible, like in Proverbs, it describes uh, this idea of ascending and descending. That's very, actually very interesting. But the point here is that he's telling them in, in Deuteronomy 30, Moses tells them that the word of God is near you, that you don't, it's not so high above that you can't ascend to, and it's not so far below that you can't reach it, that, that God met the children of Israel where they were, so that he could save them and then bring them to himself. So that's what he says in verse 8. But the word is nigh thee or near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. So um, the word of faith which he preaches. So he's, he's going to begin to, dis, to, dis, to distinguish between this, the, the mouth and the heart here. As you're going to see, there's a play that's going on here. Um, and why is that important? What's the difference between the mouth and the heart? And what's the connection between the mouth and the heart? Out of the mouth, the heart speaks. Right. Okay. So there's, so there's, there's, more, there's more connections than that. What are, what are some other connections? I can, spa I, can, I, can, I can say something, but that doesn't mean that I actually believe it, right? He's gonna, you'll, you'll see the connection here, but... So there, there's a there's a play on words here that's going on. He's actually going going to go back to go back to Isaiah 28 because what happens is remember the proud the firstborn son is proud and they boast and when you boast you're usually boasting with your mouth right like the little horn in Daniel 8 he boasts with great words it comes out of his mouth right so the idea is that your you, there's a purpose that God gave us a mouth and then there's the then there's a purpose he didn't give us a mouth for. And we tend to use the mouth for the thing he didn't give it to us for. And what he did give it to us for, we tend not to use it. And that's what he's talking about here uh, when, he, when he's going to quote Isaiah that we'll see later. I was always, so you, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No. I was always struck when a sister White writing about Jesus being the word of God, said, referred to him as being God's thought made audible. Right. That's right. Well, you know, what I'm thinking about is Jesus going down, you know, 
the descending that he does voluntarily um, in Philippians 2. <clears throat> and of course, we see the opposite of Satan in Ezekiel and Isaiah going up, 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 you know, to the most high. And we see that Jesus is the opposite. And when we know that when Jesus says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So his going down is actually kind of like in the wife role. He's modeling to us that this is a godly trait. Yes. Yeah. To go That's down, right. to be self-sacrificing, um, where it says here. Willing submission out of love. Made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant made in the likeness of men, being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I mean, there's no more descending than what he's done. Right. That's right. And 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 I think the thing that's just, as you're talking about this, that I never totally grasped until this moment, is that since Jesus says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father, Jesus is demonstrating to us that the Father... Is that way too? That's right. Self-sacrificing love. That's, that's right. right. That's why he's. That's why he's the source of life for everything, right? Because he's he's constantly giving. You know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. He's always giving. So, so God the Father, Jesus is a reflection of the Father, and the Father is is, is always giving, the same as the Son did. Yes, right. And, and when you talk about the light. And the and the the water ceremony and the and the light ceremony. You think about water. Where does it go? Always to the lowest place. Always to the lowest. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. That's right. And no one no one has ever ascended like him either. From the desolation of the cross to the pinnacle of the throne of the universe. <laughs> There's an interesting proverb if you want to go to Proverbs 30. 30? Proverbs chapter 30, yeah. Very, it's very, actually, it's very interesting. Proverbs 30 starts at verse 1. It says, These are the words of Agur, the son of Jacob, the prophecy. The man spake unto Ithiel, even unto Ithiel and Ukol. Surely I am more brutish than any man and have not the understanding of a man. I neither learn wisdom nor have the knowledge of the holy. And then he asked the question, who hath ascended into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist or who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? Wow. If thou canst tell. Every word of God is pure. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. So I, I think that uh, I think that, that proverb, that's part of the proverb that Jesus was referring to when he kept talking to Nicodemus about ascending and descending as well as what Paul is referring to. I mean, we tend to think of Moses in Deuteronomy 30, but this is, is a profound proverb because this person saying, I don't understand. I'm telling you, I don't understand. But so who, who is ascending and who is descending and what is his name and who's his son's name? That's profound insight. So, yeah. yeah. So rather than fighting to be the greatest, you know, yes. the one that, is the most like God is the servant. That's right. He just demonstrated that. And so the one who claims he knows, the one who claims that he knows, proves he doesn't know. And the one who knows that they don't know, they're the ones that know. That's what he's saying. And of course, Paul says the same thing. Uh, you but, can, and you can tie it into Jacob's vision of the ladder and the angels of God ascending and descending. That's right. Yes. So part of what Paul's saying here is that is that the Jews thought by their knowledge of God and by keeping the righteousness of the law that they were themselves ascending to God. But then the, that's the question: Who shall ascend? Who shall ascend into heaven? 
Well, it's not, it's not, it's not you and I, you and me by our righteousness. We don't ascend to heaven by that. Right. Or who shall descend into deep? That is to bring, to bring Christ up from the dead. Well, you know, he says, he says in the middle of uh, verse nine, who brings Jesus up from the dead, right? It's not you and me. It's, it's only God. So again, he's describing something that is not, it's not, it's a, it's beyond our humanity that we need to trust in the righteousness of God, that we need to trust in the power of God. We need to trust in the goodness of God, the breath of God, the love of God, the mercy of God. You know, we need to actually depend upon God. He is the creator, the source of everything. We are dependent creatures. That's what he's trying to get across to us. And that's, by the way, what the Jews didn't understand. And that's what all the firstborn didn't get, that they started being proudful or boastful of their knowledge or somehow of their righteousness whatever however they measured it that somehow they didn't need god or weren't dependent upon god and some actually begin to believe that god is dependent upon them so that's why he's that's why he's he's continuing his discussion from chapter nine about the firstborn and their thinking um because that's what's that's what is hurting his heart in verses one and two so the word is nigh thee, even thy mouth and in thy heart. Notice the mouth and the heart. We're going to talk about it some more. And the word of faith, which he preached. So the heart is connected to faith and the mouth is connected to the preaching. Then he says, if thou shalt confess with your mouth. I, I, I think that word confess is very interesting. It's homo logos. It's in, all together with the word is what it says. So confessing with my mouth is when I'm together with the word. And of course, it says that when, if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, so you're together with the logos there, right? And shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. There's a little chiastic structure there. He starts with the mouth, talks to the heart, then he talks about the heart, then he goes back to the mouth again. So again, he's, he's using this kind of play on words here that's going on. Now, there's a couple ways that this can be understood. And it's a couple ways it needs to be looked at. So the idea is that when I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart, that's the idea of me confessing and accepting in terms of justification, right? I accept the sacrifice of Christ. I, I believe in my heart and I accept. So that's... But then he says, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth he confesses. So there's two parts to this. First of all, I believe in my heart and I call on God because that's how I'm justified. That's I'm accepting, I'm accepting his righteousness. But then what happens when I believe in my heart, I begin to look at my heart and realize that my heart isn't like his heart. So then I call upon his name so that he'll restore his image in me. So there's, it's, he's not just talking about justification. I just say, oh, I believe in Jesus and I'm saved. He's talking about justification. And then he's also talking about the process of sanctification or the process of rightification. Does that, do you see that? That's why he talks about, um, call, he's going to talk about calling on God later. Because that's the whole point. So if I believe in my heart, when I look at my heart and I realize that my heart is not like God's, then I start calling on God. Lord, fix me here. That's why he quotes Joel, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's why he says in verse 11, for the scripture said, whosoever believeth on him should not be ashamed. Now, this is the second time that he's quoted this. And this comes from Isaiah 28, 16. And he's quoted Isaiah 28, uh, again, at the, at the end of chapter 9. And of course, he's quoted Isaiah a couple times in chapter 9. He's going to quote Isaiah again a couple more times here. But Isaiah 28 is significant because in Isaiah 28, as you probably already know, um, Isaiah 28 is a prophecy to Ephraim. Ephraim was the eldest son of, of the tribe of Israel. He was the, the ruler, the kingly, the kingly tribe. He, he was the eldest son of Jacob. Actually, he was the second son of Jacob. The same firstborn thing took on Joseph. Ephraim? Ephraim was the Ephraim. son of Joseph. I thought that was Joseph. He was yeah, Joseph. So Ephraim yeah. and Manasseh are the sons of Joseph. Yeah, Joseph. Yeah, but, Joseph. But Jacob put his right hand on Ephraim. 
Right. So the, the older, younger thing took place again, right? Mm -hmm. Just like the pattern. So when I, but in Isaiah 28, Ephraim is drunk with their pride and their boasting. And actually God is going to remove them from the, 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 the place of the firstborn. Of course, this is what the book of Hosea that he quoted earlier in chapter nine is the same thing. That Ephraim is actually going to be removed. The northern 10 tribes are going to be removed, and that's the tribe of Ephraim. They're, they're part of that tribe. Actually, Ephraim, again, was the ruler, the leader. And when you so you read Isaiah 28, and it talks about Ephraim's pride and their drunkenness and their boasting, and then they've actually made a covenant with death, and they believe a lie. And they, they, think, they think that God is going to accept them, and he actually says... And uh, it's in Hosea. He actually, Ephraim actually believes that he's going to accept, be accepted of God because of his father's relationship with God. That Jacob knew God, so then that makes Ephraim okay. And of course, that's the whole lie that you know that's that's by the righteousness of the law. I'm the son of Jacob, and Jacob's a uh, Jacob's a friend of God, so that makes me a friend of God. It's like no, it doesn't work that way. So this is part of what, this is actually the, the heart of what Paul is saying, because he's talking to Israel, and they think that they're God's chosen, because they're the seed of Abraham, they're the sons of Jacob, they're the, you know, they're, the, according to the law, the law of biology and the law of descendant, they're supposed to have these, the first, the first fruits, or the first son has all these, all these benefits, but that's not what's going on here at all, that's actually the opposite. So he's quoting Isaiah 20, 28. By the way, that's the same place that he talks about the stone, that God lays a foundation stone, right? So he's tying together. I know the, the stumbling stone is in Isaiah 8, 14, but he talks about the cornerstone that's laid, right? So he not only talks about the deceit, he also talks about the truth, and the truth and the, and the, and the lie are being compared to each other. But if my parents are Adventists, I'm all set, right? Yeah, I know. I'm a, what? <laughs> How many generation Adventists? Yeah, I'm a shoe-in. Mm -hmm. My grandchildren are seventh generation. Yeah. So, you know, they're really up there. Hmm. Yeah. I think it's a disadvantage, actually, myself. It's not so, supposed to be, but... <laughs> Well, well you know, if it worked that that worked that way, then I'm the the child of a bunch of reprobates, so I'm lost, right? I think it's wonderful that you know we had Rahab and Ruth and others weaved into the genealogy of Jesus. Amen. And it's amazing how that sticks in our heads, becomes part of us, right? We glory in our shame. Is that how the Bible puts it? So in verse 11, the, the scripture says, and again, he's quoting Isaiah, whosoever believes on him should not be ashamed. That's Isaiah 20, 16, by the way, that's connected to the cornerstone that God sets. So he says, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord overall is rich unto all that call upon him. See, now, now that, that's very important because there again, now you're dealing with the mouth, Right that believes with the heart and they're calling on him. And why are they calling on, on him? Well, they're calling on him because when they look at themselves, they don't see God. They don't see the character of God. They don't see, they don't measure up to the righteousness of God. So they're calling on the name of the Lord, mm. right? So when I see something wrong in me, I'm not supposed to beat the heck out of myself or I'm not supposed to blame somebody else, or I'm not supposed to grumble, I'm supposed to call on the name of the Lord. And when, and when, and when he calls, when I call upon him, he says, what's up? And I say, this is what's up. This is what I see in me that's wrong. Please come in and fix it. And then he says, thank you for inviting me in. Yes, I'm more than happy to, to, to give you my righteousness and to heal your diseases and fix your equipment. Yes, see, that's the gospel. That's what Paul is trying to say. And, and, and the fact that Israel had the word of God, but they didn't listen to the word of God. Because if, if you listen to the word of God, then you realize, oh, something's wrong with me. And then you start pleading or calling on God to, to, to be restored to rightness. If you think you're right already, then you don't understand the word of God. That's what he's telling them. Does that make sense? So whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. By the way, that's Joel. That's Joel 32, 232. Yes. Which, what is it again, Joel? Joel 32. 
I'm sorry, I just still didn't get it, Joel. 2, verse 32. Okay, sorry. Right at the end of chapter 2, where he pours out his spirit on all flesh. So then how shall they call on him of whom they have not believed? So, so he's saying if, they're, if they don't believe, then they can't, can't call on God, right? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? By the way, the word heard there, the Old Testament word heard is Shema, which yep. has to do with faith and listening and then choosing, right? The three-step process. And obeying, it means obey also. That's right. So that's so it's 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 we listen, then we think, and then we have to choose. That's why it's it's translated obey, right? And he's going to use the word obey in verse 16, but not all have obeyed, right? So this is where people get confused when he's talking about believing and obeying and they get mixed up what, what he's talking about. In the Old Testament, the idea to Shema, to listen, was the word that they used more than they used the word faith or believe. The word believe actually in faith were, was, is only actually a, a half a dozen times in the Old Testament. The word they used was Shema. So that's the word that he's using here or the concept that he's using. So how shall they believe uh, in whom they have not heard? And how should they hear without someone who calls out to them? So the word preacher is a play on the word to call out. But see, this time the idea is I call on God when I see something in me that needs to be fixed. But then when God fixes me, just like Isaiah chapter 6, remember? Isaiah sees God, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. Then he calls on God, God fixes his lips. Then God sends him out to use those lips to, to be an ambassador, to, to proclaim his name to other people so they can go through the same process. So he's playing, he's playing, doing this wordplay on calling on God and then calling others out to call on God. So he says, verse 15, how should I preach except they be sent? By the way, that's the word apostle, right? One that's sent is an apostle or an ambassador. As is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who call out the good news of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So now he, now he goes back to verse 16 and he quotes Isaiah. By the way, he keeps quoting Isaiah here because Isaiah is the gospel prophet. And Isaiah is the one that kept warning Israel that they thought because of their own righteousness that they were okay with God. And Isaiah kept warning them that they're stumbling over the stumbling stone. They don't understand. They're not understanding the process. And that if they continue in their rebellion, then God is going to reject them. And, and the gospel is going to go to the Gentiles. By the way, that's very plain in the, in the book of Isaiah. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what is happening here. Right? So that's why he keeps quoting Isaiah. But they have, not obe they have not all obeyed the gospel. So what part of the gospel did they not obey? The heart. They didn't circumcise their, their, their heart, not just their flesh. <laughs> okay. They didn't accept Christ's righteousness in the place of their own. Right. Weren't they sort of playing church? They were going through routines and thinking the routine saved them, but they weren't really understanding what it stood for. Right. So that's the, that was became the basis of their righteousness, right? And that's why they didn't accept, as Craig said, the, they didn't accept the righteousness of God because they thought that they were producing their own righteousness, hmm. right? So obeying here isn't that he's not saying that they didn't try to keep the law. That's not what he's saying. He said he's what he's saying is that their attempts to keep the law blinded them to the fact that they didn't that they didn't have didn't accept the righteousness of God and they didn't see themselves as not living up to the righteousness. So they didn't call on God for, because of his righteousness. That's that's the not obeying that they're doing here. Does that make sense? They're not believing in their heart and calling on God. You, you see, that's why people can get confused with Paul, because you, he, he uses the same term to describe actually an, an opposite effect. And, of course, you're probably going to say this, but 16, it, it looks like it's quoting Isaiah 53.1, who hath believed our report. Yes. And, and it is. It is quoting Isaiah 53.1. Yes. I wonder what that word report actually means, though. 
Well, it's the same. I think it's, I, I can look it up, but I think it's the same word. Greg will have it in a minute for it. But I think it's the same word, the idea of the glad tidings. It's the same idea of the proclamation. Yeah, okay. Hearing the sense, <laughs> audience ear fame, which he heard hearing priest report rumor. Yeah. So the idea here is, see, in Isaiah 53, what happens in Isaiah 53 is a proclamation of the Messiah bearing the sin of the people. But they didn't believe that, right? No. That's what the Jews didn't accept. They, wouldn't, they didn't accept the Messiah bearing their transgression. They thought they were righteous. So they don't call on God. See that so the uh, the the not obeying in verse sixteen is connected to not believing. So from what I can see, um, that word report is I'm probably not pronouncing it right, but Shema. Pronounced Shem, Shema, yeah. Feminine passive participle of something heard that is announcement or doctrine or news tidings. Right. The proclamation. Right. That's what the ambassador does. Right. He gives the proclamation. He makes the announcement or he sends the report. Yeah. Yep. And the, the previous verse, verse 15, is quoting from Isaiah 52. Yes. Right, right before that. Right. That's right. So they didn't. So they didn't. They didn't see the righteousness of God they do they wouldn't examine themselves in the light of the righteousness of God to realize to accept the truth that they don't have any righteousness and then they didn't call on God to restore to do a work in them to to restore his righteousness in them or restore them to his image so they could partake of the righteousness of God they believed the lie that they that they were eschewing into the kingdom and that their obedience to God's law was good enough that's what he's talking about so then he goes on, verse 17, then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the divine logos is the thought, the essence of God made audible. And it's the divine logos that is the essence of the revelation of God that reveals the righteousness of God and also reveals my unrighteousness. And when I see the difference between the righteousness of God and my unrighteousness, then I, I accept by faith that the divine logos bore my unrighteousness and the death of my unrighteousness in himself. And by faith in him bearing my death and my unrighteousness, I partake of his righteousness. And he, I, I then exercise the gift that he gave me to be restored to, back to his righteousness. That makes sense? That's what he's saying. Praise God. The Jew, that's what he's saying. The Jews or the older brother, the firstborn, did not see their needs, so they did not call upon the name of the Lord. And that's why that's why they are no longer the chosen. That's why he says in verse 18, but I say, have they not heard? And the answer is yes. Then he quotes actually Psalm 19 here, right? I think it's what, verse 1 or 2? Yes, their sound went to all the earth, their words to the end of the world. By the way, that word that goes toward the end of the world, that's the, that's the divine logos. That's the, the sun in Psalm 19 that shines and, and everything is lit with, with, lit with his glory. That sun of righteousness is Jesus himself. He shines a light in the darkness. So yes, they've heard, but they didn't, they didn't, they didn't take to heart. They didn't listen. So he says, verse 19, but I say, did Israel not know? Well, yeah, first Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by a foolish nation, I will anger you. That's in De Deuteronomy 32, by the way. And he's warning them ahead of time in Deuteronomy 32. This is right before he, he's actually going to, to go be laid to rest. And he tells them in the song of Moses, he tells them already what they're going to do. That they're going to rebel against God. They're going to reject his word. They're not going to listen to what he says. They're going to go their own way. And they're going to become a mess. And then he says, and when that happens, then God will, God will, visit, God will visit you with the, with the consequence of your own choices. And you won't like it. But when that happens, then you need to call on God. You need to turn to God. And that's what, he's, that's what 
what uh, Paul, why Paul is quoting it here, because the very thing that Moses said that they would do is the very thing that, that the Jewish nation did to the Messiah. They didn't listen. They didn't accept him. So Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by them that did not seek me. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he says, all day, I've, all day long I've held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Again, he quotes Isaiah there as well. Isaiah 65, by the way, is a chapter you can read where it, God actually promises there to those who, those who are respond in righteousness, he'll give them life. And to those who do not respond, then they will reap the, the devastating consequences of their own choice if they, restay, if they stay in their rebellion. Does that make sense? Yep. So again, Paul's talking to the firstborn who thinks that they're the firstborn. And because they're the firstborn, they have special privileges in their shoe in. And because of that, they lose, the, they lose the, the, the inheritance or the rights that were supposed to go to the firstborn. And then those, those rights actually go to the people who did not expect to receive them. In this case, uh, this is the, to the Gentiles. And so he's recalling this to Israel and because that's what happened to them. And he's recalling it to us. So he doesn't want Gentiles to become proud that now they have the gospel. Now they fall into the same trap. Which is exactly the, what happened. Which is exactly what happens to the church at Rome. That's right. Well, how it becomes the papacy and it falls into the same trap because it thinks it's the, you know, whatever. And happened to the Protestants at the time of yes. the Second Great Awakening. It takes it's, it's, it's it takes happening down to Adventists now. People. That's right. And <laughs> it's what happens to Laodicea. Yes. Yes. The other thing that Paul is the, the other thing that Paul is stressing here is that the failure of the Jews, just like the failure of all these other religious people, it's not it's not God's failure. It's not as if the word of God failed. The failure is not if in God. There's all God has given us made provision for all that we need for our salvation. Those people who are not saved are saved because of their own choices, not because a lack of God's gift or the lack of his righteousness or the lack of his mercy or his love or his compassion. That's the other thing that Paul is making clear here, that Israel has failed because Israel didn't would ref refuse to examine their heart and accept by faith the righteousness of God. There was no fault with God here. Which is, which is so strange because the people, the Calvinists who look at, take these chapters, they actually turn it all around and blame it all on God as if God determined that people were going to be saved and lost. And they, and they had to be saved and lost and couldn't do anything about it because God already predetermined it. And so they actually make it say the opposite of what Paul is actually saying here. And there, is, there are huge amounts of Christians that are sucked into this Calvinist thinking uh, just from misunderstanding of these chapters from 9 to 11. So Paul is telling us not to be disobedient or not to remain in unbelief, that when we see something in us that doesn't measure up to the righteousness of God, then we're supposed to call upon the name of the Lord. And we're supposed to confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us for our sin and to cleanse us from that unrighteous, for all unrighteousness. So he will, he will actually work in us to restore his righteousness in us, that we can reflect the image and the character of God. Of course, that's what he said in Romans 8, right? That all creation is waiting and groaning to be waiting for the sons of God, to be, sons and daughters of God to be revealed. That Actually, creation is waiting for us to grow in the knowledge of God to reflect his character, his glory, so that this mess can be over and we can go home. Well, pr praise God. He's going to provoke us to jealousy through another people. Amen. <laughs> yeah, and that's what he's going to finish up in Romans 11. We'll get to that next week. That he's doing this for a purpose. Of course, he's giving people over to their own choices, which is what, what a God of love has to do. But he's working through those choices to shine light, even to those who are as far away as they could possibly be. They also have an opportunity to be saved. That's why he says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That, by the way, that's an, awesome, that's an awesome quote, right? I mean, you think of Jonah 
and he's in the same same boat. He's a prophet of God, and he thinks he's this, and he thinks he's that, and he's not going to that nasty town of, of Nineveh, be where all those where all those evil Gentiles live and all their immorality and, and all that mess. Oh no, I'm not going there. I'm too righteous for that. And then so he so he runs away from God, and he ends up where? Well, he says he wants to get as far away from the presence of God as possible. So God gives him what he asked for, which surprises Jonah. And then when Jonah is down there, what does he do? Oh, well, so he, God. He, he wakes up. He realizes, oh, what a dummy. <laughs> Look what I did. And then what does he do? He calls on God. And what does God do? <laughs> the book of Jonah is telling you that the, the, you can't, there's nowhere, there's nowhere you can go. There's nothing you can do that can make you so far from God that God can't save you. Of course, Paul already said that, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation can separate you from the love of God, right? See, that's cool. God is really cool. And God, God, God actually, us where we are. Go ahead. And God actually used his rebellion to give him a story that actually made him a better evangelist because, you know, in Nineveh, they worship Dagon, the fish god. And, you know, Jonah had one heck of a fish story that that led them to believe and repent. <laughs> right. Well, what's neat about Jonah is that everybody he runs into becomes a believer except him. Yes. When he's on the boat, the, 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 the people don't want to throw him over because they don't want to sin against God. And they actually turn and start worshiping God. Mm. Everyone Jonah runs into becomes a believer except Jonah. The book ends and, he, and you don't know if he's, you still don't know if he's a believer or not. Mm. So Tim, it, all, it, all, it roils back to what we were talking a couple of weeks ago, right? That no matter what the situation, whichever way the user or the person goes, it still shows God's glory. That's right. That's right. You can't do anything against the truth only for the truth. And, and you show God's glory also because he loves you so much that he allows you to make the choice. And then he gives you over to what you choose. And so no matter which way you choose, you're going to, re you're going to, you're going to uh, reveal that God is right and just and holy and true and that everything he did is right. And, then when, it gets, and then when it gets so utterly dark, you can finally see a little glimmer of light and you decide... <laughs> That might be a good direction to go in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way, that, that little glimmer of light, when it gets really dark, that little glimmer of light is really, is not a little glimmer at all. Mm -hmm. But when you, haul it, you when you call out to him and you say, I got myself in an awful mess and I can't get myself out. He's faithful and he always gets you out of it. Yeah. But do we let him get it out of us? That's the question. We call on God to get us out of situations, but we don't call on him to get the mess out of us. See, that's the problem. We think once we're out of the situation, then we're then then we're free, that we're delivered. And, and God's saying, no. <laughs> I know I got you out of Egypt, but he spent them, spent 40 years trying to get Egypt out of them and they wouldn't listen. So they died in the wilderness. See, there again is the whole religion ideas. I, I, I see my situation. So I call on God. He fixes the situation. But that's not enough. He wants to fix me. And if I don't keep calling upon him, then I'm actually I'm using him to benefit myself. But I'm not I'm not worshiping God. You know, the, uh, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. You know, we know that uh, at the end of the thousand years that the wicked will, will see Christ and they'll see the city and Satan himself will bow and confess that, that God was right and just and true and there was no unrighteousness in him. Um, so that, that's just an amazing, an, an, an amazing, going to be an amazing event. But there'll be a lot of tears connected with that one. So that's why I go back to verses 9 and 10 about confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart and believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth. He, that, that's important that he's dealing with both. Just, first is justification because that's where I confess or I accept with my mouth and then I believe in my heart that he died to save me. 
And once I believe that he died to save me, now I believe in my heart. So I realize my heart isn't like him. So now I, I use my mouth to call upon him to, tr to transform my heart to, inside of me to become like him. And that's sanctification. So Paul's actually describing the whole gospel there. He's not just describing this superficial, oh, I, I, I believe on Jesus and I said it with my mouth. So now I'm saved. You know, that's not what those verses mean. If you want to study deeper into this, then you should go to the places in Isaiah that he keeps that he keeps quoting and look at the background. And then you realize the depth of what Paul is actually saying. Um, of course, as you know, when he's writing, when the New Testament writers were writing the gospel to the Gentiles, they, they didn't have the New Testament. All they had was the Old Testament. And so he's showing he's proved, teaching the gospel from the Old Testament. And of course, Isaiah is one of those beautiful books that actually clearly, clearly teaches the gospel. You might have already mentioned this, but it's interesting. I don't know if Jeff is on here, but he's very good with a lot of things. But, um, you know, it looks chiastic to me in nine where it says confess with his mouth. And then after he says heart and then it's heart again and then mouth again, you know, it's like hearts in the middle. Yep. Twice, you know. Yep, there's a chiastic structure there. And there's a there's a lot of play on words with that, as I mentioned. So the calling on God is connected to the idea of preaching. Remember the kingdom dynamics, you call, there's called, and then mm -hmm. there's the chosen, then there's faithful. So yeah. he's he, there's a lot of play on words here that he's using and to explain the gospel in terms of kingdom dynamics and uh, that call. He's using the word save three times, verse 1, verse 9, and verse 13. Yeah. I saw that yeah. too. It's interesting how much he quoted Isaiah in chapter 9 and how much he quotes Isaiah again in, in uh, chapter 10. Yes. So he's really directing the thoughts of Israel, the Jews, to, the, to Isaiah to show them that Jesus was the Messiah and to show them their rejection of the Messiah and therefore their rejection as a Jewish nation to God. But also in Isaiah is that even though the Jewish nation is rejected by God as his people, individual Jews can still call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what Isaiah is teaching. And I find it interesting that in studying about the Dead Sea Scrolls, that the one consistent thing that is they found the most significant is Isaiah. And mm -hmm. there was debate over Isaiah 53. The Jews claimed that the Christians doctored that. But now when the scrolls were found, it showed that the Jews doctored it, not the Christians. Because yeah. it, it's right there, you know, in their museum that nobody can deny it anymore i mean they can try yeah. it's interesting so god, how... god makes it clear and Amen. isaiah is i don't know that would to me i would love to study isaiah it's my favorite book of the bible you see personally you know when he's talking about the gospel he takes them to isaiah 52 and 53 yep Really. Doesn't he take them to what they're supposed to know? Yeah. Yep. You see, it starts at the beginning. He's saying, I'm so, I'm so desperate for Israel to be saved. And then he points them back to, to the Old Testament that they claim to believe and to be the defenders of and say, <laughs> here, here's your, your, your good news, your gospel, your salvation. Yeah, the oracles of God that they didn't listen to in the first place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That they claim to be the they claim to be the guardians over, but they didn't apply them to themselves, didn't apply the word to themselves. I've and never had that Daniel experience with with an Adventist scholar. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like they, they've taken Daniel out of the prophets altogether and put him in with the writings. What's that? Yeah. yeah. Well, because they have the they don't want people reading Daniel on purpose. It sh shows what spirit that's motivating those decisions. Yeah. 
Well, what's amazing though here is that these that what what Paul does say in Romans is that there is going to be um, a harvest of of the Jews at the end. Oh, I, amen. The gospel still will, very special to God. The Let's gospel, not forget that the gospel will go out. And, and when it goes to all the world, it's going to go to the Jews as well. And there's going to be a, a again gathering again. Yeah. He's going to gather them together. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you've ever read anything by F.C. Gilbert, but he was a contemporary of Ellen White, who was a Jewish man that became converted to Adventism. It's a whole story of how that happened. But he's got several books and it's very similar to The Cross and Its Shadow. But I think in some ways, even more in depth from the Hebraic position. But, you know, him, there's a lot of dialogue between him and Ellen White because they were alive at the same time. And some pretty strong statements about the Jews coming in at the end of time, saying that, like Paul, mighty in the scripture. I mean, some of these Jews have, even today, they start at an early age to memorize the Torah. And they know the scriptures better than we do. Many, you know, the Orthodox, they really know the scriptures. So, and, and I, I just, I just met somebody who's in Israel, who's, he was a rabbi with over 150 students. And he's lost his job as a rabbi because he's become an Adventist. It's a whole story. Cool. With Adventist um, World Radio, and he's working for them now. Yeah. It's happening. It's God's doing it. Yeah. Well, remember I talked to you about the, the Day of Atonement, the the sprinkling of the bull, the blood of the bull, the high priest, when he goes in the second time, he sprinkles the blood of the bull. And that 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 sprinkling of the, blood, the bull is for the high priest and his family. That's the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And then when he then he comes out, then he grabs the blood of the goat and then he goes in on his way out. He sprinkles the blood of the goat on the mercy seat. Then he sprinkles the blood of the goat on the altar of incense. When he comes out to the outer altar, then he takes the blood of the bull again and mixes it with the blood of the goat. And he sprinkles it on the brazen altar, which means that that's, that's going to be um, the judgment living or the, the gospel going specifically out to the Jewish people. It's going to go forth again. That's where Paul can say that, the, you know, that God is going to reclaim them another, a second time. At the end, there's going to be a message that goes specifically to the Jews. And you could I'd say like the same for Adventists, that. too. I need to get that in my head better, because I hadn't heard that before. That's really, really, really good. Yeah. And to the extent that, in, in a negative way, Adventists have repeated the pattern, we could also say in a positive way that God will, will do everything he can right to the end to save every Adventist and do a special work for them as well. Well, and that's the cool thing about God. God is doing this for doing the same thing for everyone. He's not a respecter of persons. Yeah. That He loves everyone, and He's desperately trying to save them. And and I I, th I keep saying that because you know His mind is supposed to become our mind. Mm -hmm. If we see someone that we think we 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 don't love, or we think we're better than them, or we think we're smarter than them, or we think we got because we got a shoe in, or we have more, and th th then th th that's not God's mind. I don't. Then I don't have the mind of God. And some I, I I am I'm I'm doing the very things that that the Jews did. I'm doing the very things that happened before. And that's and that's what how God tests us. You think okay, so I you say I want to love like God loves, and God says okay. And God sends you the most unlovable person you could possibly find. Yeah, he already did. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and, then he, and then when we respond the way we respond, like, ooh, then he goes, hello, I think you said you wanted to love like me. Mm -hmm. Right? Disobedient and, so, and gainsaying people. <laughs> so when you, these are usually the church people, by the way, that you got to see when you see them on Sabbath. And that's when we're supposed to call upon the name of the Lord. When I see right. where I don't love the way God loves, where I don't see people the way God sees people, that's when I call upon the name of the Lord. That's when he needs to, to, to fix the wiring of my mind to, to, so that I think differently, so that I, and, and fix my eyes so I can see differently, and to, and to fix my mouth so I speak differently, and cleanse my heart so love comes out of me instead of my own baggage, right? See, there, there's the test of the gospel. And sometimes you know you're walking into a situation that you need to have special prayer 
where you see so and so, you know, you say, Lord, I need help right now. I can't do this without you. Right. <laughs> and he does, but well, and, th and that's why usually it's our enemies or the people that have been so mean to us, they're the hardest ones for us to love. Because we have to forgive them and then we have to look past what they what they've done to us, right? And so that's usually the biggest test. Yeah, that's when the gospel becomes real. And all this neat information I have about all this other stuff, <laughs> realize it doesn't matter. If I don't love the way God loves, then I'm not I'm not being I'm not restored into his image. There's still a work for the gospel to do in me. If we have the gift of prophecy or give our body to be burned, but have not love. And what about the one that says love keeps no record of wrongs? Woo. Wow. Praise Especially us women. Especially us women need to remember that one, right? <laughs> if God's love didn't kept track of our wrongs, where would we be? Amen. <laughs> well, that's just it, right? <laughs> We start seeing the love of God and then we start realizing, oh boy, I, I yes, I need to call upon the name of the Lord. Yep. That's why I like that Proverbs 30. The guy starts out saying, I don't know anything. I'm just stupid and I'm blind and I don't understand a thing. <laughs> but I know the one who ascended and descended. I, I don't know. I don't. Does anybody know his name or his son's name? But I know that the word of God is true. And I can trust in the word of God. <laughs> that, that's cool. Where is that? Proverbs where? Proverbs 30. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, the words of Agar. Okay. I'll reread yeah. that. Any other questions, comments? Well, I'm really glad we started studying Romans because this is the first time I've ever studied Romans and uh, not felt like Paul was contradicting himself now that I understand the background and that he was talking to two people, two groups of people, that it really helps. Oh, good. I very much identify with Paul in this passage. That my heart's desire and prayer to God for Adventism is that they might be saved. Yeah, we're in danger of going over the same cliff, aren't we? Yep. Yeah. It's hard to do evangelism, too, because the church doesn't want to, you know, we don't want those people here type of thing. You know, I mean. Yeah, I, I see that part, but I think the other part is just as true is that evangelism is hard because the people that we're inviting, when they look at us, they don't see a life transformed by the gospel. That's right. And 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 we're we're good at rattling off a whole bunch a bunch of neat information, but we're not we are not demonstrations of of the love of God. We're not a, a walking demonstration of the power of God to, to transform lives. And then and, and people aren't interested. The, these younger generations, the Gen X, and these generations have come up. They're not investing their life into some idea that you have, and they're going to spend 50, 60 years trying to figure out if it's right or not. They're not interested. If they don't see something that's going to benefit them, then they're not playing the game. And that's why the churches are empty of these young people. They're not interested in that game. No, they see right through it. That's right. And so, so there's, it's, 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 just, it's, just, it's not just our perspective of these unworthy people. It's also their perspective of us that is stopping the gospel from, from affecting them. Well, what they what they saw was that we preached one thing and did another. I, on my trip just now, I met somebody who was raised Adventists, and their their parent, especially their father, was very was very strict and Pharisaical, mm -hmm. and really, you know, quote believed, you know, and was very, you know, serious about his faith, but just presented a picture of God to the children that basically terrified them and pushed them away. And he, he le you know, left the church for a time and, and then praise God, he, he brought them through a process of suffering that led him back to the truth in a, 
better understanding of who God was. But I mean, it was the, a perfect, you know, textbook example of, of what Paul's talking about right here was, was his, his exact mm-hmm. life experience that he shared with us. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Well, if our kids live with us and they see us be one way at home, and then we, they see us go to church and we put on a mask and we're two different people, then how were they supposed to be attracted to our supposed religion? Because you're not supposed to let them look at you. You're supposed to point them to God all the time. And when they look at you, they're going to see a sinner. But when you point them to God. Yeah, that's why when we mess up, it's important just to... Own it. Tell our children that and yeah. apologize to them and say, you know, the way I handled that was not the way Jesus would handle it, and I'm sorry. But well, see, that's see, see that's Jesus. modeling the gospel right there. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, I had a therapist, and he said, "You never ever admit to a kid that you made a mistake." And I looked at him and I said, "Do you really think they don't know?" <laughs> Well, and the sad thing, Dan, is that kids, children tend to look at their parents as the example. Right. So, so it, it's, it's true. It's true when we get older and that, that can be used as an excuse because the, you know, the children need to make their own choices. But the point is, is that we, if we model growth to them, then we would, you know, when I mess up, I say, oh, I've messed up. And, and then you, you let the kids know it's okay to mess up. You just call on God and then you, you show them the process, right? Right. The, fact, the fact of the matter is, is we, we were supposed to be models of God for our children. Yes, <laughs> that, was, that's that right. was the intended purpose. <laughs> right. And right, but when we fail, it's important to let them know that, you know, we're not playing. We're, we're honest here in our true condition, and they need to see that, and they respect that. And if you have a person who's done wrong to you, and they come and they tell you that they were wrong and they apologize you respect them more they they actually go up in your mind sit it down right yeah because it's being real well the cool thing is no matter what damage has happened in the past god is able to reach people where they are and and love them out of the mess they're in yes. and uh good for that Praise God for that, because I don't know, you know, I'm a father and I'm, I, I can't tell you I've raised my sons exactly correct and I've done it right all the time. There's no way that's true. So, yes. well, praise God, this brother, you know, God was really using him and working through him. Doesn't leave us where we are. <laughs> he loves us enough to come to where we are, but he doesn't, he loves us too much to leave us there. And that's great. Yeah. Yeah. As long as there's breath, there's hope. That's what I'm praying for. I made it to the end. Did you see that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think we need to learn to call upon the name of the Lord. I I, I don't think that we teach that properly. Um, you know, the idea that when I see something in me that doesn't measure up to the righteousness of God, that I'm supposed to be calling upon his name. Which means that I'm supposed to be calling upon the name of the Lord a lot. Yeah. Amen to that. It's supposed to be a constant practice. I I call that my SOS prayer. I'm in trouble and I need help right now. Please, Lord. (laughs) I know that I'm not thinking right or I'm not feeling right or I'm not responding right and I need help. Amen. And it's, yeah, and it's like if you I, I have to, to practice that constantly. <laughs> yeah, it's like if you want me to love that person, Lord, you need to do it through me. <laughs> well, that's what Paul says, like bringing bringing every thought into the obedience right. of Christ, right? The thing is, when I listen to most people's prayer requests, they're still praying about God fixing situations outside of them rather than fixing the equipment that's in them, mm-hmm. and that shows a lack of spiritual maturity because most of the time god can't well most of the time god cannot fix the situation because it's the machinery in me that the situation is supposed to be making manifest and if he takes away the situation then i'll think i'm okay and i'm not Mm -hmm. so i pray for the situation to go away and the situation doesn't go away well that's because 
the, the, the situation is supposed to be revealing broken equipment in me that I'm supposed to be calling on God and asking him to fix. Mm -hmm. and, and when I call on God and he fixes the machinery in me, then the situation goes away because it's not necessary anymore. There you go. It's exactly right. And we're going to keep going through the same ropes over and over again until we learn. We might as well learn by God's right, we, grace. Because it's not right. going to stop until we do. Yeah. What was really cool today is uh, I called my neighbor to let him know how Ashley was doing because he knows her. And we ended up getting in this long conversation. And believe it or not, God was in the conversation. <laughs> and... This is Man. only the second conversation that we've ever had that had the word God in it. And, you know, it, it, I've been here two years next month. Wow. It's taken two years, and I think we're finally becoming good friends. And if anybody had ever told me I'd ever be friends with this obnoxious SOB, you know, but now I don't see him like that. I see him as very <laughs> a very injured person. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, he's a he's a very injured person, and I've been trying to help him and be a good neighbor to him for two years, and he's finally accepting that I'm being real. Amen. <laughs> God has been doing that how long in your life? <laughs> With him for two years. No, no your for life, you. my for life. You. <laughs> <For> that. <laughs> two years is just a drop in the bucket. Yeah, but it's cool when you see people in their 80s and having all these health problems on their last leg and they're starting and they start to wake up to their need for God. That's he, just cool. He is 80. He's going to be 86 on the 20th. He actually told me when his birthday was and I wished him a happy birthday ahead of time. And he said, I'm going to be 86. And, you know, remember, Pastor Tim, you told me that I was the only Christian in his life and God put me here for a reason to hang in there with him. Yep. Yeah. And two yep. years later, two years later. Cool. And God knows what he's doing. And that was I only will. because you called on the name of the Lord when you had yeah. trouble, when he was cranky and nasty, and, and you called on the name of the Lord, and he helped <laughs> you to know how to ha have wisdom and have love in your heart that you didn't have of yourself. I've walked away from that place so many times and said to God, just shut my mouth, get me out of here, you know, before I say something I shouldn't, and then talk to God for the next two days and said, do I really have to go back down there and deal with him some more? And God sent me back every single time. Amen. It turned out that God wasn't wanting me to deal with him. God wanted me to deal with me. Yeah, there you go, Jonah. Isn't that what you just <laughs> said, Tim? <laughs> Tim, I don't, I don't want it going, you know, making the head explode. But most of this was not possible till we met you, and you started opening up the scriptures to us as God has revealed them to you, and you're Amen. passing it on to us. It, it, it just, it changes lives. And thank you. It has changed now. Yep. Praise God, because it's because you guys have changed my life. Cool. But, but yeah. you modeled, you modeled how to deal with people like that and then god called on me to do it too it's like okay you know now it's your turn it's like really uh i don't know what i'm doing it's like okay i but i do you know just let me do it through you it's well, like, amen you want this done you, you're gonna have to do it through me because god i don't know what i'm doing I, I'd rather deal with dogs, Lord, you know. I, I'm really not great at, with people, you know. Could I please deal with dogs? Well, you got two. You can deal with them. But, you know, I didn't send the gospel to the dogs. I sent the gospel to the people. <laughs> well, thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the encouragement. Um, but don't worry, it doesn't go to my head. I don't. <laughs> oh, I, didn't, I, I I knew it didn't. I, it would be very facetious, and I apologize. I shouldn't. Have. No, that's fine. But I think I, I'm honestly. I think God is preparing us. There's a storm coming. Oh yeah. There's a storm coming, and God is going to need people that call upon His name and cling to Him and won't let go, mm -hmm. and are willing to become anything to anyone to shine light to the dark. There's a wave of darkness coming. 
that Satan wants to deceive this world. And God wants us to shine like stars and lead many to righteousness. You know, so he's preparing a people to, to be those lights and to lead others. And so we need to we need to try to grow, mature ourselves. Yeah, and, my uh, favorite my favorite and constant prayer now is God save me from myself. <laughs> That's not me. <laughs> well, the point the point here is that the growers will become leaders, and that you you know you won't be just following a Moses; you will become the Moses for other people. <laughs> you laugh, but that's it's what it's what God requires, it's what God desires. Well, a true leader leads people to Jesus' feet. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So far, through, I haven't looked word. behind me and seen anybody following. Well. I'll tell you, we the darkness that's coming is, and you know what happens when the darkness hits is that Satan tends to get us by ourselves, and we think we're the only one. We're all alone, and we're walking in the darkness. Well, that's the time to 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 call on God and start shining. It's not the mm -hmm. time to start whining, right? So I I think that God is. Shining, shining great light because it's it's time for us to grow up. We've been children way too long. Yeah. Well, I've come to the conclusion that God knew exactly what he was doing when he put me up here because, I mean, I've got Louie and Dawn that I'm working with and Brick and Barbara and Daryl Albert down here and his family and, and my friend Ashley and Scott and Rich and, you know, I... When I moved up here, especially when I lost my car, it's like, how am I supposed to work with anybody like this? It's like, don't worry, Gene, I'll send them right to your doorstep. But the one he was working on the most was me. Dear Heavenly Father, the love that would not let us go, thank you so much. Thank you so much for loving us. No matter how far astray we've gone or how far astray we are, no matter what we have in us, this twistedness or these ideas, these imaginations of our mind that aren't in touch with reality, no matter what you find in us, um, what we find in us through you shining light, we, you, we realize you love us anyway, and you want to love us out of that mess and to become, to be restored, to be, to be like you. Thank you for the privilege of your word. Thank you for the privilege of these beautiful people that I've come to know and that we become and are becoming a, fam a church family, brothers and sisters in Christ. Mm -hmm. Probably, Father, prepare us for the storm that's coming so that we can. We can shine the light of the love of Jesus to anybody, no matter how they treat us, no matter what happens. And that truly your light will shine in the darkness and others will come to the kingdom because of the work that you're doing in us. Give us the courage. Give us the patience. Give us the strength. Give us the faithfulness, Lord, uh, to be like you. Thank you so much for your love and your grace. Remember the sick among us. Um, I pray again for Pauline and, and Sue and her family and, and the hard times they're going through there. Thank you for being with Lil. Be with Dan and Lil and mm -hmm. Lil's eyes. And, and we think of Ashley and, and others that are on our each of our prayer lists. Father, I want to remember all of our children and our, and our grandchildren as well, that they would see the cha change that's taking place in us and realize and want to know the love of God for themselves. Just bless us, I pray, and I thank you for your grace in Jesus' name.